Well, hello um, and good morning and good evening to all of you. Uh, welcome to the U.S. India Business Council webinar for the discussion on U.S. India relations in an age of uncertainty. We hope that you, your families, and your teams are all safe and in good health. USIBC has been focused uh, most of our time and energy on working with all of you to ensure the continuity of essential businesses, um, working with you to advocate for necessary policies and problem solve with you as we work through these extraordinary and challenging times uh, during the global pandemic. But you know, it's important for us to be able to take a step back from time to time to broaden our gaze and to look at what this pandemic has meant for the bilateral relationship between the United States and India. Um, we started this year with a historic visit by President Trump to India in February, and things seem to be on a path for greater cooperation. We had important defense deals announced, and we were in the midst of negotiating a mini trade agreement. It seems, although, that even before Air Force One had cleared Indian airspace, that the gaze shifted to other things. Uh, certainly, first and foremost was the impact of the pandemic uh, and uh, the requirement of all countries to address uh, important safety issues and then the global uh, economic ramifications as such. We're really fortunate today to have a really a great panel of speakers with us uh, for a discussion on what this uh, in pandemic has meant on the U.S.-India front. Ravi Agarwal, the editor of Foreign Policy magazine, um, joining a and leading a discussion with two policy analysts who are prominent in the India space, uh, Tandi Madan of the Brookings Institution and Dhruva Jai Shankar of the Observer Research Foundation. Thank you both, uh, all three of you so much for joining us. Before I turn this over to them, I want to highlight that in addition to today's session, um, we have a series of thought leadership events and uh, town hall events um, on Friday. We will have a members interaction with USTR's Chris Wilson uh, on Friday, and then on Monday we will have US Ambassador Ken Juster. So please keep an, email, uh, an eye out for those emails. But today we are really excited to be able to have this uh, important conversation on the bilateral relationship. And with that, let me turn this over to Ravi Agarwal. Ravi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nisha. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thanks for having me back at USIBC. And as we often have to say these days, I really hope everyone on this call is doing OK and that you and yours are safe. These are trying times, but we're doing exactly the right thing by staying at home and engaging ourselves with calls such as these. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, Tanmi Madan and Dhruva Jayashankar, who many of you know. Remember, you can put questions to them just by typing in what you want to ask in the Teams app, and then I will put them to them. So please do have a think about questions you'd like to ask. Before we get to Tanvi and Dhruv, however, a few bigger picture thoughts from me. We're all here because we care about the US-India relationship. As Nisha has already pointed out today and several times in the past before, the broad strokes of the US-India partnership have been on an upward trajectory for the last two de decades. Among experts, there's general consensus on that assessment. And in India, uh, uh, the same is the case, but India is also one of the few issues around which there's bipartisan consensus on Capitol Hill. And that remains the case. India is seen still as a hedge against China and Asia, and it also comprises with the US, the two largest democracies on earth. Now, when US President Donald Trump was elected in 2016 and in the months that followed, it's fair to say that world leaders were largely stunned. How do you deal with such an unusual administration? No matter your political persuasion, it's fair to say that Trump has a unique style. He's undiplomatic. And that shakes things up not only domestically, but in diplomatic relations and the world at large. Trump's foreign policy worldview, in as much as there is one, is one of reciprocity. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Individual bilateral deals tend to be more important than multilateral ones, as we've seen, because it is in those individual deals that the US can wean out specific gains, or so the theory goes. Now, in its very inception, the America First ideology could have hurt the India relationship. One, of course, is transaction based and immediate, but the other is morals and rules based and longer term. 
The strange thing is that despite those differences, India-US ties have held up surprisingly well. Why is that? And that's what this call is about, I guess. But to quickly list them, there's growing defense ties, defense sales. Uh, Washington has authorized the sale of advanced weapon systems such as Predator drones. And those ties have strengthened the overall relationship between the two countries. Um, Washington now conducts more military exercises with New Delhi than with any other non-NATO partner. There's the high level two plus two partnership, which is building trust, the parliamentary exchange program, new cooperation and sharing on intelligence, disaster relief, export trade. And then there's the personal chemistry, which we often talk about. I'm personally skeptical about making too much about personal chemistry. So it's so shown that at the very least, Modi and Trump have identified an area where they can both be very useful to each other. They like to draw in big crowds. I think Trump realized that firsthand when he joined Modi for his Howdy Modi event in Houston. And that played a huge part in the return visit to India and the Namaste Trump event there, which drew in tens of thousands of people. These things aren't substantive necessarily, but they're very important in signaling more broadly to the world's media and to people that the partnership is important. Now, before I get to Thanvi and Dhruv, uh, just a couple of quick thoughts on the moment that we're all living through, COVID-19. Um, the world has consistently underestimated how serious the coronavirus is and how quickly it will spread. By the same token, I think it's quite likely that countries will also overestimate how quickly they can reverse shutdowns and reopen their economies. We should be aware of that. Much of the conversation around fighting the pandemic right now is around flattening the curve. But what we forget is that in doing so, we won't have a vaccine for quite a while. And even the countries that have been successful in flattening the curve so far may easily have second and third waves of infections. The second point there is that the pandemic is already destroying industries. In many countries, restaurants and bars will never reopen in the same way. Supply chains will change. Already after the US-China trade war, countries were beginning to shift some of their manufacturing away from China. Those moves may accelerate. Other industries from tourism to entertainment to fitness will have to adapt and change. And then lastly, once this is all over, we'll return to a new normal of sorts, whatever that ends up being. What happens then to relations between countries? Will diplomacy change? Will leaders change the old approach and pay much more attention to localism? to improving domestic healthcare and infrastructure over and above diplomacy? What happens to defense? And with all of that, what happens to the US-India relationship? So with those thoughts, um, and I would love for you all to ask questions, type them into your Teams app, and we will get them, vet them, and put them to our experts. But on that, let me introduce both of them. Tanvi Madan is the director of the India Project at Brookings. She's also a senior fellow there. She's the author of a terrific new book, Fateful Triangle, how China shaped US-India relations during the Cold War. Uh, this is a tough time to come up with a new book, so please do place an order for it, not on Amazon, but at your nearest independent bookstore. And Dhruva Jashankar is the director of the US initiative at the Observer Research Foundation. He was based in New Delhi, now he's in Washington, DC. Tanvi, I'm going to turn to you first for your opening remarks. You have five minutes. Unmute your mic, please. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Um, good morning to those of you in the US and good evening to those of you uh, in other parts of the world. Um, what I thought I'd do is uh, two things, which is one, briefly lay out where we stand today in the U.S. and your relationship, what we've seen, uh, what the dynamics we've seen over the last uh, few weeks as this COVID uh, crisis has developed in both countries and globally. And second, uh, lay out three kind of broad, uh, broad elements uh, that could potentially have a longer term or medium to long term impact on the U.S. and your relationship. Just in terms of kind of uh, the approach we've seen the US and India take towards each other over the last few weeks, I think it's fairly reflective of what we've seen in US-India relations uh, in the Trump administration, which is for strategic and economic reasons, uh, a desire to cooperate where possible uh, and to manage differences where necessary. And as has been the case over the last few years, this diff these differences have often kind of revolved around the issue 
uh, of trade. Um, so just briefly, kind of some specific things that we've seen in terms of the kind of the short term impact. We have seen uh, a delay, a cancellation of some initiatives uh, that we, we had hoped to see after the Trump visit to India. So, for example, Defense Secretary Esper was scheduled uh, to be in India. That visit has had to be uh, put off. Uh, we are also likely to see a number of other engagement as well as kind of not just diplomatic or economic, but even defense ones, military exercise that are in the pipeline potentially put off. Uh, perhaps even to next year, depending on how this plays out. I'm um, also unclear in is the impact on what we had, what both countries had said uh, we would be seeing, uh, which is over the next few months or the uh, even the next few weeks, uh, which was a phase one trade deal. Uh, and the amount kind of the bandwidth that this uh, crisis is taking with that, we're not quite clear where that stands uh, at the moment. Having said that, these are kind of the more adverse impacts we've seen. We have seen uh, the US and India also focus on a fair degree of engagement uh, on the COVID situation and the potential impact of it uh, over the last few weeks. Just to give you a few things, there's of course uh, a phone call between President Trump and Prime Minister Modi. But we've also had three phone calls now in the last two weeks between uh, Foreign Minister Jayashankar and Secretary of State Pompeo. We've seen a call between the, the defense ministers. Uh, we're also seeing kind of the networks that the two countries have built on the public health front actually go into effect. The two CDCs have very close relations. The US CDC actually helped India uh, built its ep epidemic intelligence service over the last uh, few years. And so there are both these kind of formal institutional ties, but also informal networks between medical professionals and public health professionals in the US and India that have been put uh, to use on that bilateral sp uh, side. Uh, on the regional side, what we've seen uh, is the US put together uh, and convene at the Deputy Secretary of State level uh, and India join as well as other countries. Uh, what's essentially the Quad Plus group, um, whether you, you can call it kind of the Indo-Pacific counter COVID group, uh, it is essentially a Quad Plus group which involves weekly phone calls at the Foreign Secretary level in India, Deputy Secretary of State level here. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, other, the other countries involved are uh, the other two quad countries, Australia, Japan, but also interestingly, New Zealand, uh, the S South Koreans uh, and uh, uh, Vietnam as well. Um, and so you're seeing these countries talk about two different things. One is the response to COVID itself, uh, procuring equipment, uh, how they can coordinate. Uh, but also uh, on the agenda is economic recovery uh, after uh, in the aftermath or even during the course of how this is playing out. Um, globally, what we, we're we probably not seeing it uh, and we will not see it, uh, but I think you will see the US and India coordinate in international and regional institutions behind the scenes uh, to try to develop uh, particularly in questions that involve Chinese membership and behavior in international institutions. I think you will see uh, engagement on that. Uh, very briefly, let me just lay out three different trends or aspects to watch uh, that I think will over time uh, affect how we the trajectory of US India relations over the medium to long term. I think the first one is what the US and India do at home. Uh, specifically how the, the COVID crisis and the situation develops in both countries, both on the health side and the economic aspects of it and the fallout of that, uh, how the governments tackle it, how successful they are at tackling it, uh, but also at home, do these the leaders in both countries, in, in, in Indian case, Prime Minister Modi, uh, in the US case, President Trump or whoever comes next, whether that's him or, or somebody else, uh, do they use this crisis as an opportunity to make some bigger structural changes? The second uh, trend to watch is uh, the China aspect of this, uh, which is we're seeing that both the US and India, as well as a number of the other allies and partners, like-minded countries, uh, it is very clear during this crisis that they need China, uh, particularly for equipment of all sorts. Uh, but you're also seeing this crisis reinforce and Chinese behavior during it, uh, reinforce the, uh, the concerns that these countries have had about China, whether that's geopolitical concerns about Chinese influence operations, uh, but also concerns about dependence on China for economic and other kind of critical needs. And in the US case, I think in India, there's already kind of a fairly large amount of skepticism uh, on, uh, uh, on China. I think you're seeing an expanded amount of skepticism on the part of the US public 
uh, on China over this course. So what is going to be the impact of that? What we have seen over the last uh, decade and a half is that shared concerns about China have driven the US and India together. Uh, so the trends could be that that will be something that will get reinforced over time because of both countries concerned. Finally, I will say uh, a thing to watch uh, is the broader impact on globalization, the flow, what this crisis does to a country's perceptions of uh, how they're going to deal with the flow of goods, services and people. Um, and I think you could see this play out in two different, very different ways, and that will uh, uh, kind of uh, make the impact clearer to us, is one, do you see a trend uh, where leaders actually use this crisis as an opp opportunity uh, to, for example, uh, reform their economies, make some tough decisions, invest in research and innovation at home, but also engaging uh, in, uh, uh, in kind of more forward-leaning behavior. So in India's case, does India use this opportunity to try to attract private investment looking to diversify uh, from China into uh, India? Uh, or do you see the opposite? You could also see a very kind of opposite contradictory trend uh, where you do see, uh, as Ravi pointed out, a trend towards increasing localization, increasing kind of bringing production at home. And if every big country starts to doing it, do it, America first and India first, that will actually have potentially an adverse consequence in how this plays out. You're already seeing some of these globalization questions play out on two issues. Uh, one you probably read about and has been playing out uh, export restrictions that India had placed on hydro hydroxychloroquine, but also a wider range of drugs. The other one to watch for uh, over the next few months is the immigration questions uh, coming stemming from a number of Indians in the United States uh, whose visas will be expired, whether because they're graduating students or work visas, how the U.S. handles that, how India and the U.S. work towards handling that question uh, is going to be a question, I think, that will play into these questions of how globalization and questions about that will impact U.S.-India relations. Thanks, Tanvi. There's a lot to unpack there. I can't wait to do that. Question and answers to follow, but first, let's turn to Dhruva Jayashankar now for his opening remarks. Dhruva, you have five minutes. Thank you, Ravi, and uh, thank you to U.S. India Business Council for this opportunity. Uh, Tanvi is always a hard act to follow, uh, and she covered uh, quite a lot in in in, in her time. I, in some ways, I'll, I'll, uh, I don't want to repeat what what she said, but I think I'll just repackage it or re uh, reanalyze it in a slightly different way. Um, and I think you know you can look at U.S. India relations along three broad dimensions, which are bilateral relations. Uh, strategic relations, particularly how they relate to third countries and regions, and then issues of global governance that that uh, in some ways are an outgrowth of the, the first two. And I think if we were to look at those three baskets of the, or the those three aspects of the relationship, um, I would I would just sort of to summarize it, I would be somewhat sort of cautiously pessimistic on on the bilateral relations front. I think there's some some challenges. They've been pretty well navigated so far, but I I do think they've not gone away. Um, cautiously optimistic on the strategic relations basket because I think there has been some quite momentous, uh, uh, significant forward progress, although I think sometimes there's a tendency to over overstate or, or, or uh, overinterpret some of that uh, those changes. Um, and, um, and then I think it's a more mixed picture on the global governance side, uh, and I'll try and very briefly uh, talk about the sort of positives and negatives of each of these. On the bilateral relationship side, I think the two big areas are, are of course, trade and economic relations on the one hand, uh, and the sort of people-to-people -people, uh, ties encompassing immigration values and, and other things being the second aspect of that. On the trade side, you know, I think the, the lack of a, a sort of a, a breakthrough trade agreement, even a, a sort of more modest phase one type agreement, uh, has been a source of some frustration. We've been expecting it for some time. It may be further delayed, and this would be so something to discuss with Chris Wilson when you do a, um, a, a similar discussion with him soon. Um, on the other hand, I think it's, it's important to point out that uh, U.S.-India bilateral trade has actually grown over the last five years quite significantly, uh, despite some adverse headwinds uh, in, in both countries. Uh, it's also become more balanced. So U.S. exports have gone from 40 billion in 2015 to 52 billion in, in uh, 2018. It's been, been a, a quite significant increase. Uh, and Indian exports have to the U.S. have also grown in this time. Uh, on the U.S. side, of course, this has been largely on uh, defense, civil aviation, energy have been some of the bigger drivers of this. But again, the, the overall metrics, I, I think, uh, paint a more positive picture than sometimes we, we see in the headlines, which reflect the lack of a, a trade agreement. 
Um, on the people to people side, uh, again, I, I, some of this may be punted into the second, uh, into the uh, after November. We will see what happens in the U.S. presidential elections. Um, but I think one thing to to sort of watch is how much that becomes uh, this becomes more or less of a problem in the U.S. India bilateral relationship. Uh, and I think Tanvi rightly pointed out some of the issues in immigration that may become uh, come to the fore more. Uh, in, in the in the current Trump administration, I think we've seen uh, some of those issues uh, basically because of a lack of movement in Congress not become as as big an issue as, as it could be in the US India bilateral relationship. Uh, moving to strategic relations, you know, again, I think uh, we have a more positive picture. There's been much more coordination on Indo-Pacific issues uh, in very meaningful, tangible ways. I don't think it's just about the rhetoric. Sometimes the rhetoric has led and the, the action items have followed. Uh, but I think if you see now, we have a level of maritime uh, cooperation between the U.S. and India that I don't think a lot of people could have foreseen five, five six years ago. Um, a much greater level of comfort, uh, enabling agreements that have been on the on the negotiating table for 10 years have now been uh, concluded. Some have started to be uh, implemented as well. Uh, we're seeing a multilateral cooperation with with like minded partners, Japan, Australia and others as well, uh, and also a level of coordination in areas that India had previously thought were, was very sensitive. So countries like Nepal and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, which which uh, even on Pakistan, I think you're seeing a more uh, 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 a similar approach is reflected in the uh, negotiations on uh, ending the war in Afghanistan. You're seeing a level of comfort now between the US and India that was not evident 10 years ago. Uh, so again, uh, I, I, cautiously optimistic, I think there's been some incremental but meaningful progress on, on that front. Finally, the global governance picture, I think, has, has been much more mixed and in some ways has been an outgrowth of the other two. Um, on trade, I think that we still see at the WTO and other places a, great, a lot more um, uh, uh, sort of clashes between US and Indian negotiators or, or not a uh, meeting of the minds. But we have seen, on the other hand, coordination, uh, greater coordination at the United Nations uh, and the UN Security Council uh, when India has been a member. Uh, on COVID in terms of disaster emergency response, as, as uh, Tanvi rightly pointed out. But I, I would also point to um, you know a few other things. Uh, last month, for example, there was a vote on uh, for the Director General of the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. Um, and uh, the US and India actually coordinated efforts quite closely to ensure that the Singaporean candidate, Darren Tang, got, got elected over a China a Chinese candidate uh, who, who, who he was up against. So, so I think that is reflective in some ways of a kind of new uh, sort of a new normal in, in U.S.-India coordination on global affairs. Again, this is more on a case-by-case -case basis, and there, there are plenty of issues on which the U.S. and India disagree uh, and will continue to disagree, uh, but I, I do think this is reflective of some changes. So I'll end on that note, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Dhruva. Um, and for those of you who are just joining us, uh, I'm Ravi Agrawal, Managing Editor of Foreign Policy. I'm going to begin a Q&A now on the uncertainty in the India-U.S. partnership in the months ahead with Thanvi Madan of Brookings and Dhruva Jay Shankar of the Observer Research Foundation. I see a couple of questions have come in already. Please feel free to ask uh, more questions and I will put them to Dhruva and Thanvi as we go along. I want to start first with a few of my own questions and I think it's only natural to begin with COVID-19 and the impacts it's having around the world. Um, Thanvi, I'm going to start with you on this one and I just want you to unpack a little bit uh, this week's phone call between Trump, Trump and Modi um, at a briefing on Sunday, Trump said the United States could retaliate against India if New Delhi didn't reverse its decision to stop exports of hydroxychloroquine. India is, of course, the world's biggest producer of that anti-malarial drug. Um, just give us a sense of how that message may have been received domestically in India um, and what it would have been like then to subsequently reverse. Is that do you see that as something that would be a blip in the relationship or something that could bleed into other areas? So I think what you're seeing is um, something that has played out again and again over the, and this is a very Trump specific uh, issue that uh, has come up in US-India relations, which is he often says the quiet part out loud, uh, which then, uh, you know, it, it's not that countries, for example, do not have these very frank discussions about, you know, we have concerns about this export rest restrictions you placed, for existing contracts, uh, it goes to sanctity of agreements. Uh, and while recognizing India's domestic needs, it's clear at the moment that it has more than uh, sufficient capacity to meet both domestic uh, needs and these uh, export kind of contracts. 
Uh, and so you, it's quite normal for countries to behind the scenes uh, have these discussions about uh, what it would mean, the consequences of uh, um, a step like that that India, India would take. Um, but you usually do not then go out and say publicly uh, that, you know, uh, if you that there would be these consequences potentially if India takes that step. I think that's the part uh, that's made it, you know, it, it, but it's not it is not something the Modi government hasn't dealt with before. Uh, there is a public statement coming from the president uh, that they have then had to deal with uh, the fallout of where you do see their critics in India, uh, critics not just of the Modi government, but of the US relationship as well, uh, saying that, look, uh, is this is how a so-called partner is treating us. The way the Modi government has handled this uh, in the past, and we have seen, I think, signs that they, they will do so this time as well, uh, which is not to get into a back public back and forth on this question uh, and wait for kind of others to point out, um, uh, including you've seen a number of trade economists point out that it's actually good for India to continue to export and this blanket ban was not a good idea. So I think in the short term, people who are skeptical of the US and of the Modi government's uh, doubling down uh, on the US relationship, even if they belong to previous administrations in India that did, you know, uh, that did strengthen that relationship, uh, you're going to see critics, this will reinforce their point about their kind of skepticism of the US. Uh, but I think there, you know, there is it will, I think, over the long term, that to me is the bigger question. Does it reinforce this idea? Because it's not just the India that has put the, these export restrictions, which I suspect the way things played out, you know, one side, it was the left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing, uh, which is, you know, from the diplomatic perspective, it was mm. clear there were going to be consequences for this. Uh, but, you know, the people who uh, had to make a call on needing domestic supplies uh, issued the span. Uh, so I think over the longer term, the impact, the questions about what do all these export restrictions, not just that India is putting, uh, but other countries, the US has put export restrictions as well. Um, to me, the bigger concern is not the short term, because I think the governments will deal with it. Do we start to see a kind of beggar thy partner approach to this, which is that everybody decides you have to produce these things at home, can't depend on others. What does it do to that broader conversation of how much you can depend? So I think India actually putting these caveat actually shows, look, we're going to we're going to be responsible stakeholders here. That's a good sign. Uh, but I think in, in, in the short term, it does create a little bit of kind of at least a public relations issue that both sides have to deal with. But I, I think they will try to move on from it as, as quickly as possible. Let's hope so. And I should make clear that uh, even though India has reversed its stance, it hasn't made clear how much it will uh, move into exports, how much it will keep domestically. We'll probably find out more soon. Um, Dhruva, staying on this theme, uh, you wrote an interesting essay in the Hindustan Times this week about the pandemic and globalization. And in that article, you argue that the coronavirus may slow down certain globalizing trends that had already decelerated. Um, but let me push you on that and ask you what you think the pandemic will do specifically to the India-US partnership. I know that's a very tough question because there's so much that we don't know is going to happen in the next few months. But broadly, what are areas that you think may emerge in the next few months stronger and what would be weaker? Right. Uh, you know, I, it's hard to say. And, you know, I, I, I don't like too much doing sort of crystal ball gazing. Uh, I, I, you know, I tend to try and look at what are existing trends and, and how they might change. And that's what I tried to do in that piece in particular. But, uh, you know, I think if one had to, I think you, you would see a very mixed picture emerge. There are areas where I think uh, clearly there will be a sort of renationalization underway, as Tanvi laid out, where uh, lots of countries, not just the United States and India, but including both of those, will say there are certain essential commodities that we have to. Uh, even if it leads to short-term price rises, we have to, uh, for the sake of national security or, or well-being, we, we have to uh, start manufacturing at home and incentives will be provided for that. Uh, so again, we have this very strange situation right now where uh, the US may be dependent on India for gener certain generic pharmaceutical drugs, but India in turn is dependent on China for the active pharmaceutical ingredients, the API, uh, that, to, to produce the generic. So it's it's a very sort of strange relationship that, that has emerged. Um, and th that all assumed that, again, Again, that they would not be either artificial or man-made 
um, or, or natural dis um, uh, uh, disturbances to those supply lines. Uh, again, the, the, the coronavirus uh, epidemic ha pandemic has thrown some of that into question. So I think we may see the renationalization of certain industries, certain sectors more, will be more affected by that. In other areas, I think where they will be, and this is where I think the sort of trust in the US-India relationship matters, and it's a sort of intangible commodity to measure, uh, there will be areas where, not again, not just the US and not just India, but countries will say, listen, we, we are okay with uh, with uh, supply chains moving to countries that we can trust for, for various reasons. They are they're more open, they're more democratic, they can be held to account or for, for, for whatever reason. Um, and so again, we have seen this, um, and some of it may be, again, part of a natural diversification strategy. Um, I've pointed out to, to people that uh, over the last few years, and this predates the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic, uh, that uh, Australia, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan have all implemented formal or informal policies uh, at, the, at the highest levels of government to try and incentivize their companies to diversify away from mainland China. And that the largest beneficiaries that they've been pushing um, or, or incentivizing their companies to, to invest in have been one, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, and two, India and South Asia. Uh, so uh, parts of East Africa as well. So again, uh, several countries already have uh, formal or informal policies in place to 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 move some of their manufacturing to to other other countries, partly as a diversification strategy, partly because of, of specific concerns about China. So again, we may see some of that happen. And again, if India gets its act together, uh, still lots of ifs. Uh, there are certain uh, there there's certain ways that India can take advantage of that. Tanvi, I want to look at the China angle, uh, sort of still within the broader coronavirus sort of framework. And in both India and the United States, there were some factions that have attempted to highlight the coronavirus as a Chinese virus. I imagine that kerfuffle will die out. But more substance substantively, how do you see the India-U.S. partnership? Um, changing because of the pandemic? And where do you see China fitting into that equation in the coming months? So I think that, I mean, the China angle is interesting. I mean, unlike the Trump administration, the Modi government was very careful not to use terms like the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus. Uh, they did not, um, they did not criticize, have not criticized China publicly as a government. Um, and, you know, they have, they were very quick uh, in terms of sending uh, about 15 tons, 15 to 16 tons of medical assistance, which they highlighted to uh, China very early on in the crisis, uh, as as China was dealing with uh, with its West uh, impact. Um, so I think you know you've seen the the government itself in India not take uh, not take kind of a very hostile stance or critical stance of of China. Having said that, there are concerns existing. This the way China has behaved existing concerns within the Indian government uh, that frankly were far more widespread uh, and conventional um, than in the US or Europe, uh, these concerns will be reinforced. The lack of transparency, uh, the lack of trust, uh, you know, can you depend on China? Some of these discussions about moving, uh, again, of decreasing Indian dependence, for example, on APIs, advanced pharmaceutical in ingredients on China have been ongoing for the last two years. Uh, and I think this will reinforce uh, the concerns, geopolitical, economic, and kind of technological and broader concerns about China. So I think beyond even these particular issues, you could see spillover into, for example, the 5G Huawei debate, uh, where you know you have people who are skeptical say, look, if we can't trust China on this, how can we trust it on something even more critical uh, in terms of their transparency uh, and their willingness to work uh, with us? So I think. Uh, on the China question itself, this will reinforce concerns on both sides. I think where it'll have an impact on the US and India relationship, I think in the short term, India will be careful on the one hand because it needs uh, PPE, uh, testing kits, ventilators from China, and it needs China to keep those freight and cargo lines uh, open and flowing. Um, but I think you're also seeing, and this is where this kind of Indian participation in the Indo-Pacific group comes up or India and the US engaging in international institutions, as Trevor pointed out, this is where you'll see that uh, tendency also. So you'll see the kind of stabilizing the China relationship, but at the same time doubling down on uh, the US relationship for India if the US stays on the same page and shares the same concerns on China. Um, but also this is going to be more important for the US and India to work with allies and partners because everybody's going to be resource constrained uh, because domestic needs are going to take up a lot of 
you know, fiscal resources that they could have other sp otherwise spent on defense spending or dealing with China in other ways. So I think it will, to me, um, most of the signs are that it will reinforce this tendency towards kind of US-India cooperation on the strategic side. Um, I think the one caveat that I would add is you could see, and I think this is this concern about China is bipartisan, uh, Democrats and Republicans share it. Uh, the one caveat I would say is you could see potentially a Biden administration next year, uh, even despite kind of cons advisors around him that are concerned about China and have shared these concerns. You could see a democratic administration where there's pre pressure from the left to, re uh, left to reduce defense spending, uh, but also uh, a, a President Biden's own instincts to uh, cooperate with China on things like pandemics and climate change. Uh, you could see him move towards cooperation with China. I think that could have an impact on U.S.-India relations, but that's more kind of a, a, a potential uh, uh, factor that I, I, I think will, is is uh, not impossible, but but unlikely. I have two quick points here uh, before I come back to Dhruv, but uh, as Thunvi was talking, I saw some news flashes that the Sanders campaign may have suspended uh, uh, its campaign for this year. Uh, I cannot confirm that myself, but if that is the case, then Thunvi's prediction about Biden is one step closer to being reality. Uh, at least in it becoming a clear two-way race now. Um, but the other thing that Thanvi mentioned about trust is very interesting because um, it's not just uh, trust between nations that is being tested right now in this moment, but also trust within societies. Uh, Frank Fukuyama's great book about high trust and low trust societies is very instructive now just in seeing how countries are responding in this pandemic uh, and how people are responding to lockdown measures and how trust trusting they are of their governments in terms of their healthcare responses and capabilities. Um, Dhruv, I want to put um, a question to you that is linked to what we're discussing about trust. Um, and that is that much has been made about the relationship between the US federal government and states in addressing the pandemic. How is that dynamic playing out in India between uh, the Modi government at the center and various state governments? and depending on your answer, does this speak or not to the larger importance of Indian states in recent times? Right. Uh, no, that's a good question. And actually, I'm not sure I'm the best place to answer that. Some of you might have more insights on that particular issue. Uh, but <clears throat> I would just make a few points on that. One is, um, you know, you, uh, India, like the US, is a federal uh, structure. States have, there's a very a clear listing in the constitution as to what falls under states' rights and what falls under uh, the central government's rights and where there, there are some uh, issues where, where it's mixed, where the central government has uh, a basic veto power over the state governments. Um, now, law and order is technically a, a state level issue. Uh, and so, you know, dealing with the pandemic actually, in, in I think under normal circumstances, we would have seen a much uh, stronger role for the state. Uh, we did see then, uh, however, um, the, the Modi government implement a sort of national level lockdown, uh, which is which is quite unusual. Uh, they had been anticipated by some state governments, which had previously done uh, so state level uh, type lockdowns. But I think the, the, the unprecedented nature of this really uh, saw the, uh, the, the prime minister and the national, the, the federal government, the central government taking a role in, in uh, implementing uh, that. That le then le led to certain sort of secondary problems. And one of those issues, which many of you will have seen in the news, is that um, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, one of those issues is that the uh, question of migrants uh, 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 came up, which is whose responsibility w were these people, say migrant migrant workers in in Delhi, uh, whether did the Delhi state governments were they or were they responsible to the place where they were they actually from UP or Bihar or wherever else they were they were from, or was it really a, a sort of central government matter? And so you saw some scrambling after the lockdown was implemented, uh, after an, a, some very quick finger pointing where everybody was sort of thought it was somebody else's problem, you did see some some efforts come together uh, quite belatedly. But that, that shows you in some ways some of the implementation problems that still exist uh, when when things fall, sometimes fall between the gaps either between states or between the central and, and state governments. Um, so uh, in, in this particular case, that's how it played out. I would say, however, you know, for a lot of people who are interested on the business side, uh, I would be looking a lot more at, at what the state governments are doing on a state by state basis uh, in terms of creating a, a sort of uh, this, this immense variation 
it seems in India uh, in terms of say the ease of doing business uh, from state to state. Uh, and another thing I like to point out is even in terms of levels of development, uh, human development and education, uh, you have um, uh, states in Western and Southern India, which are, you know, roughly on par with a country like Indonesia, uh, so more developed. And then you have, you know, UP and Bihar and Jharkhand, which are really lagging behind uh, closer to Ethiopia on, on many human development indicators. And so you have this immense state by state variation. Thanks, Dhruv. I think Dhruv always starts his answers by saying uh, he's not the right person and then ends up giving us a terrific answer. Um, I'm Ravi Agarwal uh, from Foreign Policy Magazine. If you're joining us late, this is a discussion we're having with Tanvi Madan, Dhruva Jay Shankar about the India-US partnership uh, in a very uncertain time. We're getting quite a few questions uh, mostly related to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of them to Tanvi and Dhruva before we move on to other topics. But please feel free to ask uh, questions on other topics as well if you'd like. It's very simple. Just click on the Q&A button, type in your question. It'll come to me and then I'll put it to Tanvi and Dhruv. Um, Tanvi, uh, the next one is for you um, and it stays with uh, coronavirus, as I said. Um, it's from an anonymous uh, listener on this call uh, and his or her question is that India has not requested international assistance for a disaster in 16 years until this pandemic. Now that it has, the U.S. is ability to provide assistance is limited. USAID has provided just less than three million in assistance, which made a splash in the news in India. But organizations like the World Bank have provided a billion dollars and China is now providing aid to India as well as to other countries. Do you see, Tanvi, the provision of medical supplies and aid to India as potentially shifting India's relationships with key partners? Or is this just India accepting help from anywhere that is willing to offer it? So I think particularly if you think about the impact on in how Indians see the US and China, I think you know it is clear that it's not just in India, but across the world where people have been surprised by uh, the nature of the US uh, response. And that will do have an impact on how perception of the US. Having said that, I think, you know, India, and it might be a little bit of an exception in this in some ways, or it might be reflective of a broader trend, that whatever its concerns about the US ability to kind of put down a certain amount of money, um, I think depending on how the US and China, it's not just about the aid, but how you portray and play it, it also speaks to broader relationships. To me, what we've seen so far, and I think we will likely see, is that it will reinforce existing perceptions um, with the caveat, unless there's kind of some major shift. But you will see this reinforcing kind of some concerns uh, that uh, Indians have about uh, different countries, or if they are supportive of certain relationships, they will choose to see the positive uh, aspects of this. And I'll, I'll give one kind of exception to that, which is uh, just on the US-China side. I think you see, for example, uh, the US uh, would have played a role in ensuring that billion dollars of World Bank aid, given that it's, it has voting power, would have gone to India, would have helped, you know, the president of the World Bank uh, is, uh, is American. So there would have, you know, it depends on if this is subtly conveyed. But if the U.S. makes the mistake that I think China is making, which is you cannot, uh, you know, kind of ask for gr gratitude, uh, that will not go down well. I think the best thing to, for the U.S. to do is continue because it's not just money, it's technical assistance, it's working together. I think this Indo-Pacific uh, kind of counter-COVID group, uh, those kind of things help. I think the mistake the Chinese to some extent have made with India and they've made this repeatedly is it's not that they are, It's not, I think people will appreciate the help they're giving. It's the point that they keep kind of the, the tone that it's coming with, which is a very patronizing tone that it took them weeks to acknowledge the the aid, the medical assistance that India gave them. Uh, and on the other hand, have been talking about kind of India as a, in somewhat condescending and patronizing tones, uh, you know, that it is, it is kind of saying, look, we are doing you a favor. Um, and I think so you've seen in India this aid from, or this is, most of it is actually being procured and the Indian government's been very specific to say, look, we're procuring this. This is not a lot of Chinese assistance. There's some. You're seeing Indians actually say, but look, the Chinese might be giving this to us, um, but it's almost like they caused the crisis in the first place or they helped kind of make it worse. And now they're trying to profit off it. 
And so I think if the, the Chinese need to be a little subtler if they want to get benefits in India from this uh, on how they actually approach the, 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 the public aspect of this. Thanks, Tanvi. I can say from uh, my own take on this, uh, given that I live in Manhattan and that China has just sent a thousand ventilators to New York, that uh, New Yorkers are going to be fairly grateful uh, in the coming months, depending on how this plays out. Um, please do keep sending in your questions uh, on the platform and I will put them to Thanvi and Dhruv. Meanwhile, I want to start shifting a little bit to other topics, although we can come back to the pandemic because it is such a, a dominant uh, issue right now. Dhruva, I want to ask you how you see the growth of the Indian economy purely in terms of what it means to the US relationship. Mm -hmm. And to put that another way, so India's inevitable slowing growth in the coming months means that it will not be able to invest as much in defense deals or in military upgrades or in other areas of partnership uh, with not only the United States, but with other countries as well. Um, what will that, all of that specifically mean then um, for the US-India partnership with, uh, you know, a global economy that is really struggling? Right. No, I think I think again the, the two ways of looking at this. On the one hand, I think it's clearly disappointing. Uh, you know, we've seen growth figures slow down to a level that I don't think um, you know many Indians were uh, hoping uh, it would slow down to this level uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, and again, a number of, of factors, some of which are outside the Indian government's control, including the coronavirus pandemic, have contributed further to the difficulties in trying to get uh, you know India out of this uh, uh, out of this period of, of underperformance, if you will. Um, now that being said, uh, uh, I think if you look relative to many other places, um, India, you know, the overall Indian economy, for a number, again, for a number of fact, a number of reasons, um, you know, some of which are somewhat accidental, uh, are, is, you know, still seems to be doing uh, uh, okay under the circumstances. So uh, we haven't seen the volatility that we've seen in certain uh, other emerging economies that are very dependent on resource exports, such as Russia or Brazil. Uh, we haven't seen, um, uh, you know, so so while we have seen a sort of steady growth, uh, a, a slowdown. On the other hand, we haven't seen the sort of impressive growth rates that Vietnam and Bangladesh, for example, have uh, experienced over the last couple of years. And so clearly they are taking advantage of uh, of uh, a slowdown in China in, in, uh, in, in a way that India as a whole has not been able to do so. So what does this mean going forward? I would say until last year, we didn't see a major reflection um, for uh, in this sort of uh, uh, sort of four percent, five percent growth rate uh, on uh, the factors that really mattered for India's external power. So, for example, we still continue to see a pretty healthy increase in India's aid budget, a pretty healthy increase in India's capital defense budget. I mean, roughly on par or higher than the overall GDP growth rate. This year, I think this last budget was a bit of an exception. And for the first time, I think you could feel a little bit of a pinch in terms of a, pre, uh, so a flattening of the defense capital budget, which is sort of one key indicator, I would say. And another is the sort of the aid budget as well. Uh, the overseas aid budget. Uh, uh, and, and again, these are just sort of uh, indicative of the instruments of strength that India would, would have to develop to uh, uh, to uh, sort of implement its, its uh, influence uh, overseas. So uh, again, I think this uh, that is a worrisome sign. And uh, I think we still have to see going forward whether this is a blip or whether this is a uh, this is an increase. But uh, it's not just simply about the the, the resources. Uh, again, on the on the one hand, while the economy has slowed, uh, tax revenues have increased. Uh, uh, partly again as a function of uh, a number of uh, changes, including uh, the, uh, the the GST that 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 was implemented a few years ago. So so uh, uh, and also growing um, uh, sort of. Uh, 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 Basically, growing monitoring of bank, you know, uh, rise in bank accounts and other things. So, while tax revenue had increased, the allocation of that tax revenue, which which had been more towards areas like aid and defense, and uh, uh, comparatively, uh, seems to have slowed as there's been an emphasis. Now, just to answer one quick question that has been posed, we may see a little bit of a windfall from declining energy prices. So that's a little bit of a, a wild card that has now been thrown in and how the Indian government chooses to use any such windfall, whether it allocates it towards other subsidies or whether it chooses to allocate it elsewhere, I think remains to be seen. Uh, sorry, Drew, just to push you on that, did you say that you, you think that the Indian government may double subsidies, sorry, reduce subsidies on, on, on petrol and diesel? 
No, I, I, I don't know uh, if that's on the cards at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the past, when there has been a, dec- you know, a few years ago, there was a, a sharp decline in, in energy prices and the government faced a choice as to what it should do with it. And it chose instead of uh, doubling down on subsidies, it actually chose to try and f- fix some of the, uh, you know, the fiscal deficit and, and, and other issues. So I, I think the, 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 the one sort of silver lining, if you will, is we, if we do see a, 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 a fall in energy prices, the government will face a slightly uh, more uh, a positive uh, problem about how to how to allocate those those resources. Sure, and we are indeed seeing uh, greatly reduced oil prices. NYMEX crude, for example, I believe is trading at about twenty-four dollars uh, right now. And just a year ago, it was in the sixty to seventy range. Five or six years ago, it was more than a hundred, hundred and twenty at certain points. So, in that sense, uh, it really does go some ways towards uh, helping India with its deficit reduction. Although at this moment. Uh, it's not like people are uh, really consuming uh, as much energy as they would under normal circumstances. So that is also a factor the Indian government will have to pursue. Um, Tanvi, I want to come to you with uh, another uh, audience question. This also is from an anonymous uh, listener on this call. Um, And if it is not your area of expertise, feel free to dodge this one. But the question is that There are reports that up to 80% of Indians are skipping out right now on critical vaccinations for measles and other diseases because of COVID-19 and that these things could have longer lasting impacts than the pandemic itself. Um, There are also doctors who have been evicted from their homes due to fears that they are spreading the virus. All of this, our questioner points out, will have global long lasting impacts. So the question to you, Tanvi, then, if you can answer it, um, is how the US and India can partner to address any secondary health impacts that could ultimately be worse than the pandemic itself? Uh, so Ravi, I am not, uh, as you alluded to, I am not a either a doctor or a public health expert, but I, I do think what we have heard uh, both uh, kind of public health and medical professionals who are familiar with the Indian environment actually point to this and is something uh, both the central and state governments are actually quite aware of um, uh, on this kind of uh, question of not just kind of COVID and its fallout uh, and its direct fallout, but the pressure on the health infrastructure. I mean, we've seen even kind of the US and European countries um, suffer from this. Uh, but I think this is going to have a greater impact. And it's been pointed to that this is going to be a major concern, the pressure on the health infrastructure. And what will this mean for kind of the diseases that are uh, kind of found in India quite quite, and are quite widespread um, and how to deal with it. So I think the the one good thing is this is kind of something that people are very aware of. I think what the US and India can do, and I think it's going to be in an environment where everybody's resources are constrained, Um, I think is kind of work to build, and this is a a medium term thing, but it has to, some of it will have to go in short term, uh, which is some of the kind of networks that I mentioned that a lot of what the cooperation on the public health side of the US and India have is on these kind of more widespread uh, existing health concerns in India. I think what the US and India can do is double down on those. Um, but also, I think over time, you know, it, it is a responsibility for both countries uh, to actually do some kind of nation building at home, so to speak. And I think this is where building health capacity and capability uh, over the medium term is going to be uh, is going to be uh, a, um, a have to be a priority for both countries. And hopefully, that's something you will see. I think one caveat to that is something you know Driver talked about earlier, which is. I think you'll see the impact of this uh, uh, play out very differently across different states. Uh, and I would say that any an, an Indian's experience of uh, not just kind of uh, the COVID situation, but the uh, kind of secondary impact of this will very much depend on where they live in India. Um, because I think this speaks to a broader issue. You'll hear a lot of debates about regime type and who's best to dealing with this non-democracy and devo- democracies. To me, what we're seeing, and we're seeing this in states in India as well, which is not about system of government or regime type, it's about governance. And so I think even on this issue, it's going to be a governance question uh, and a whole set of issues in terms of capabilities and capacities that states have on the health side, but also on their bureaucratic capacity, uh, private sector capacity, the leadership uh, available in those particular states. Uh, the technical competence, um, as well as their ability, kind of how much experience have they had dealing 
with epidemic or pandemics in the past and trying to maintain a kind of normal health infrastructure. But I think there is no doubt this is going to be a major concern uh, for both Indian state and central governments uh, uh, over the next uh, year or so. Thanks for being a good sport on that, Tanvi. We have a few minutes left. I want to pivot to defense a little bit and then end with politics. Um, uh, Dhruv, I'm going to come to you for a defense related question. This is also um, published in our uh, channel, so I think it's from one of our listeners in. But the broader question is, you know, much has been made of the US-India defense partnership at a strategic level. It's grown in acquisitions. Do you think we're reaching a peak? And then also related to that, Dhruva, um, how has the fact that the US-India sort of defense partnership has expanded, how has that fact impacted New Delhi's relations with, say, Moscow or China or, or France? Uh, right, no, that's a, a good question. I mean, that's been one of the, you know, sort of touted as one of the more hopeful aspects of the US-India relationship. And I think, you know, if, if, if you take a step back and you look at a sort of 15 year time horizon, uh, the strides that have been made have been really impressive. So, you know, India now has uh, has at least seven major defense platforms uh, that are, are sourced from the United States, uh, mostly aircraft, one uh, artillery uh, uh, piece. Uh, and, uh, you know, last year in 2019, 22% of uh, India's imports, defense imports, were from the United States. So it's a pretty impressive number, uh, given that it was in the single digits not, not too long previously. There have been periods of spike and uh, spikes in the past as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, again, the long term picture has, has been has been uh, good. We're, we're, I think, entering into a different phase now where the focus is less on sales and on coordination and, and the sort of uh, essential agreements. This was sort of a first step of developing the US-India defense relationship. But we're moving and, and, and military exercise to another element of that. But we're now moving into another phase where we're moving slowly towards um, uh, joint defense production and eventually with, you know, with the idea being to move towards joint defense R&D, uh, research and development. And, you know, that's the kind of relationship that the U.S. has really only with a few key allies, NATO, Japan, uh, South Korea, Turkey, uh, Israel, uh, and, a, and a handful of others. Um, and, and that, I think, is sort of, we, we're now up at, at those kinds of hurdles. Um, the you know, on the plus side, we've seen some very low level cooperation in terms of uh, U.S. investments and uh, production, uh, manufacturing of defense components uh, below a sort of a full platform uh, that's already taking place. So to give an example, uh, there are now F-16 components being manufactured in India uh, uh, for the F-16, which India does not even fly. Uh, and so India is being slowly uh, integrated into a sort of a more global defense supply chain. So that I think is a sort of plus side. We're seeing also a nascent uh, private defense industry emerge in India, which can now provide competition with state-owned enterprises, uh, the public sector units in, in, uh, in India. So, uh, and, and provides also an alternative for partnership for US, uh, US companies. So I think uh, this is the kind of phase we are we are in now, which is how to how to build upon that. And that means so cracking some pretty difficulty uh, decisions related to how India procures its its defense um, uh, its defense equipment. Um, and then the I would say another further challenge is also uh, increasing uh, India's own ability to absorb technology. So again, an earlier stage of defense cooperation was about removing the barriers to technology sharing between the United States and India. We've now mostly got, gotten over that and even the Trump administration has contributed to that in a way. Uh, we're now at a stage, I think, where we're looking at how, how India can develop capacity. So capacity in metallurgy is now pretty, is sort of coming up to, up to standards, but other areas in India are still quite deficient. One of the challenges I find on the Indian side is when you talk to India about the US India defense market they want to go to 11 immediately and so they you know they they're, they're asking for cooperation in in uh, jet propulsion in 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 nuclear uh, propulsion for submarines areas where the US is still very um, uh, wary about sharing that technology with anybody. I mean, forget about India, but even a lot of its NATO allies, it doesn't share that kind of technology. So, so I think th th uh, finding a way to to square that circle and the expectations on both sides will be part of the the next step. Uh, so it'll be a very different kind of challenge. But I do think we're now at another, you know, uh, having successfully overcome a first major set of hurdles in the U.S. India defense relationship. We're now at the cusp of trying to address the second uh, set of challenges. Dhruva, and I want to stay with you for a very quick uh, uh, audience question. Uh, I'll ask you to keep it brief because we're almost out of time. This one is from Arjun Malhotra, uh, and he's asking, apart from the oil question, 
what's the role of financial flows and movements in the market? So the US stimulus, the actions of the US Fed and others in shaping broader US-India relations. You know, I, I'm not a finance person, so I, I, I actually probably can't. I would just say two quick things on that. One is, uh, I think we've seen actually a strengthening of the dollar uh, in the last uh, amidst all of this. I think it's it's a kind of a bit of a story that, that hasn't gotten as much attention, but something to watch in terms of what the long-term implications are. The Fed has moved very quickly. Uh, so, uh, and then I think, you know, overall, I think if, if the U.S. economy can survive this uh, as intact as possible, obviously that would that would help the U.S.-India overall relationship. Uh, it would help uh, those people in India who think that the U.S. is a, is a, is a, a good investment in the long run. So uh, I, I would look at that. I, I can't really speak to the details about uh, the emerging market index and how that might affect uh, the US-India relationship. Sure, completely understand. Um, Tandi, I'm going to put the final audience question to you, and that is about national security threats to India from its neighbors. Uh, are those threats reduced amid this pandemic and its aftermath? Um, there seem to be signs of cooperation. Do you see that as something that is fleeting or could it endure? Uh, just a quick answer from you, please. I think very quickly, you know, as, as it's, it's true of a number of issues around the world, um, and th the COVID situation does not mean that all the other differences and complications uh, that had existed have gone away. They still exist. And uh, as far as China is concerned, um, I think we're not going to see a, a major shift because the fundamental differences between the two countries remain. And so far, there's nothing about the COVID crisis that suggests uh, that either side will be motivated in the short term to deal with them in, 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 in and the broader strategic competition is being reinforced. I think on the Pakistan side, some of this is going to depend on uh, the dynamics between China and Pakistan and how those play out. Some of it is going to depend on what happens with Pakistan domestically uh, and the impact of the spread of COVID there on civil military, uh, civil military relations. But again, I think fundamental issues. I mean, as uh, as we speak, uh, there's they're kind of they're still um, uh, you know there's uh, firing across uh, the the LOC. So that hasn't gone away. So I think you know this these are the kind of situations which yes, in some cases can help alleviate. But we're not seeing those signs. Uh, it's this is taking up a lot of bandwidth. Uh, but those existing problems haven't gone away. And in some ways, it actually might. Uh, reinforce some of the competitive elements. Uh, there could be signs. I think Prime Minister Modi very quickly has uh, reached out, has, has used this moment to pivot a little bit, to, to kind of try to revive SARC or at least show that he's willing to uh, open the door to dealing with Pakistan again. So once the situation calms down, perhaps we'll see some movement on that front. Uh, there is a, a SARC meeting scheduled uh, that uh, Pakistan will, and Pakistani leadership will get an invite to later this year. Let's see if it's held. Again, these offer openings. Uh, but much of it will depend on whether uh, leadership on different sides actually takes advantage of this uh, in a more positive direction. We're almost out of time, but uh, Tanvi, I'm going to uh, ask you for one more quick uh, set of thoughts from you. Um, let's say, uh, I mean, the, the big 2020 story was meant to be the U.S. elections. And, you know, we spend most of our time thinking and talking and writing about the coronavirus now. But um, just very quickly on the elections, given that they're still going to come up quite soon and they're going, going to go ahead. Um, what are the implications of these elections for India, uh, whether Trump wins or loses and whether we see a President Biden one year from now or not? Just a quick answer from you. Um, sure. I think, you know, um, the it, it obviously the Indian government is watching this very closely. In any case, I think the next few months we're going to be able to keep going to be about keeping things stable till that election. Um, I think it means very different things who is president, whether because this is not a regular going from a centrist Republican to a kind of democratic administration or vice versa. Um, I think uh, India will be uh, quite comfortable uh, with the Biden administration. Broadly, they are familiar with him. Uh, he was, he's, was quite engaged uh, on India, whether when he was vice president or senator. Um, I think there will be questions, though, about some of these broader trends. What does a Biden presidency mean uh, for, uh, for example, um, the China question? What will it mean for U.S. presence abroad? Um, but India will prefer the, the kind of certainty or stability, at least, that a Biden administration will bring, uh, the kind of doubling downs, perhaps, on allies and partners. And India would actually like uh, the U.S. to invest uh, more at home in building U.S. capacity. So I think in, India has now uh, realized and decided that a, a strong U.S. Is in, is in Indian interest. And if a Biden administration moves towards that, a more active, a strong U.S., they will like that. 
I think the second Trump administration, uh, on the one hand, uh, Prime Minister Modi has made very clear the U.S. relationship is important and he's going to find a way to deal with uh, the kind of differences that a, a Trump uh, presidency actually means and a Trump as president means. Um, but I think uh, we should not assume that a Trump second term would look exactly like a Trump first term. I think the president will perhaps move uh, even more and we'll see that his, his approach towards trade, towards uh, uh, immigration and such issues have been reinforced and validated, and he will double down on them in ways that will create comp complications potentially for India. Having said that, uh, India would not mind at least the broader concerns and competitive view of China that potentially will continue to see in second uh, in a second Trump term. And to Tanvi's point about first and second terms, I think you only need to look at India. Uh, and the difference between Modi's first term and his second term in terms of some of the policies they've uh, felt emboldened to pursue uh, as an example of how things can change. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tanvi Madan of uh, the Brookings Institute uh, and Dhruva Shankar of ORF for their time and their insights and for being as sporting as they've been to take on uh, questions that may even be outside of their lanes. Um, and for um, sharing with us some very smart takes and thoughts on the U.S.-India partnership and where things are headed. As a closing, a uh, couple of things to say. Um, we began uh, this session talking about the coronavirus pandemic, and I think, you know, as a journalist who covers this and runs a magazine that has been covering this issue now for well over three months, um, I think the way I've approached it, and I think we'll all need to approach it, unfortunately, in the coming months, is with a real sense of humility. Uh, this is uh, a new coronavirus that has completely surprised all of us with its uh, intensity and its infectiousness. And I think many of the things that we do and the way that we look at the world will change in the coming months. And the honest truth is we just don't know. We just don't know the extent to which anything and things could change. I think in moments like this, compassion, uh, empathy and sympathy for those around us, cheesy as though they, that might sound, is very important. Um, so I ask all of you to stay safe, stay indoors until we know better. Uh, and I wish you all the best. I'm Ravi Agrawal. It's been a real pleasure hosting uh, the last hour with you discussing uh, the US-India partnership. Thanks to USIBC for uh, providing a forum for this. And with that, I'm going to um, hand uh, this mic back to Nisha Biswal. Thank you to her as well for bringing us together. Nisha. Thank you so much, Ravi. Um, I think you summed it up beautifully. This has been just a really enlightening discussion and conversation. I have to say I had to exercise a great deal of self-discipline to not throw myself into the conversation, but uh, really benefited so much from learning uh, your perspectives, uh, uh, Tanvi and Dhruva. And Ravi, the work that foreign policy has been doing, um, not only throughout this uh, pandemic crisis, but really uh, just the uh, excellent uh, anal uh, analysis, uh, news information, and thought leadership that we get from Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, we're so proud to be able to partner with you you and collaborate with you on opportunities like this. Um, USIBC will continue to bring to you these kinds of um, um, analyses and um, you know engage on the larger US-India corridor. I think that our discussion today highlighted not only what's at stake for both countries, but also how both countries are trying to find their way in kind of a new post-pandemic uh, um, order that is going to be different. Um, the world is going to be changed. Our economy will change. Geopolitics will change uh, and be impacted by all of this. And we at the U.S.-India Business Council will be here with you engaging on these issues and ensuring that we can continue to strengthen and support uh, the U.S.-India corridor because it is so important for both countries and for both our populations. So uh, stay tuned for more events. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, um, USTR Chris Wilson this Friday and Ambassador Juster on Monday.
Um, we also will come to you in the coming weeks and months with some ideas about what that post pandemic order looks like. What are some emerging opportunities and challenges? Um, how will our economies be changed and how can our businesses be prepared for that? So, uh, you know, stick with us and let's um, navigate these new and uncharted uh, waters together. Uh, and with that, I want to wish everybody who is celebrating a happy Passover, a happy Easter, and a happy spring. Um, be safe and uh, stay connected. Thank you all very much.